Welcome, mere mortals, to another conversation. And I've got a question for you. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like to be in Europe during the Chernobyl disaster? Well, look no further. Recently, I had a chat with Paul Boyd. Paul is the head of academy program for the upper levels and also choreographer in residence for the Queensland Ballet. So Paul has had a very extensive career in the ballet industry being a principal dancer. But then just to add on to that has some insane stories from his life. As I mentioned before, we got a bit of the feelings and his story of being in Germany during the time of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, but also we dived into his backstory related to how he overcame some very, very extensive childhood bullying before ending on a bit of a lighter note with regards to some of his experiences in the ballet world, his travel that he has been all around the world, and also the discipline it requires to be a top ballet dancer. So with all that being said, I hope you enjoy this conversation and I bring you Paul Boyd. I was wondering if you could take us back to the day of Saturday 26, 1986. Well, well you, you remember it well. Yeah, uh, well, I was, I was uh, not born yet, but I, I know my history. <laughs> Yeah, well, we were living in uh, in Germany at the time, in Düsseldorf. Yeah, so Germany. this was you and your wife my wife, at the time? my wife, yeah. and yeah. we had actually our daughter had been born six days earlier. Okay, yeah, she was born on the eighteenth of. Would that be right? Eight, uh, that would be the days? Uh, the eighteenth would be eight days earlier. Eight days yeah. earlier, and um, yeah, we were living our life, and the baby was born, and suddenly we get a whiff of something is not right on the news something is something's happened at a at a, at a nuclear plant in uh, in chernobyl mm. in the ukraine and things we felt that things were very kind of swept under the carpet in germany yeah no one yeah. was really telling anybody really we we found not 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 such clear messages mm. and we had our families from uh, from australia ringing us frantic Yep. Get out, get yep. out, get out. And we'd already been living there for six years in Germany, in Dusseldorf. So we had our life there. You know, we had, yep. we, our, our, I, was a, I was a soloist with the ballet company, big ballet company there in Dusseldorf. Mm. And I had my career and, uh, you know, we were, we were very happy and, and, and settled there. And then the crunch, <laughs> the crunch was one morning my wife, once we started to get a feel for maybe something is really not right here, my wife was on the phone to a very good friend of ours in, uh, in Munich, and she was a ballerina, a principal ballerina in, in Munich, her and her husband. And Laurel, this friend of ours, she said <clears throat> she, had just, she, she had been newly pregnant. And she said that she'd been to the doctor, and the doctor said that the worst affected would be the newborn mm. and the unborn. Yeah. And my wife, I remember, she just had the phone crying. Yeah. So I thought... I've got to make a stand here. I have to do something about this. I actually have to get the family out of here. Yeah. So I, <laughs> it was very strange. I remember showering, going down into the cellar. We had an apartment, so we're going into the cellar. And I got a big trunk and I bought the trunk up and I proceeded to take pictures off the wall of the apartment and pack her. She said, my wife said, what on earth are you doing? I said, we're leaving. She said, what are you talking about? We can't just leave. I said, we're leaving. I'm getting you out of here. We just don't know what the future holds here. Mm. And I, we were frightened. We were absolutely frightened for yeah. our lives. Once we, once we realized, and then what, what did, well, I, I actually go back a little bit, a couple of days. We had been out, um, one of the first outings with our daughter uh, as a little a little newborn yeah, and yeah. our son too went to a park he was in the Ryan our son who's now 37 he was two at the time um, was in a park in a sand pit and playing in this sand pit and we went home that night and on the news it said do not let your children out no. and do not let your children play in the sand yeah yeah don't, don't so, <laughs> two big crosses right so that huge crosses so yeah. we really started to realize that something was really not right there mm. and we as australians have the opportunity to um to get out to just evacuate yeah. the problem is is that i i'm i'm con obviously contracted in the ballet company i've got performances coming up and all of that sort of stuff so i went to my boss and i said i'm whether you like it or not i'm actually leaving and he mm. said you can't you can't just go and leave i said i'm going to have a family so what happened is that i was very very lucky the the in those big german ballet theaters you've got a ballet director an opera director a theater director and a uh, an orchestra director those directors have a boss 
and he's called the general intendant, the general intendant. Mm -hmm. And I was extremely lucky because this man for six years stood very much behind my career. He was a big push for my career in Germany. So he, I had, a, I made an appointment with him to go and speak with him and thank God because he, he said, I give you my blessing. He said, if I was you with a young family, I would also make tracks back home. If I had that Australian passport, I would make my way home. Yeah. So within two weeks, my wife was gone with the children just sent her back home and I had to probably wait another two or three weeks because I had to, uh, well, they had to bring in another dancer to replace me because um, being a soloist, you've got to have, you know, they've got to be able to come in and do certain roles. So yeah. they bought, they had somebody that came in and I and I left and came back, came yeah. back home. <laughs> wow, wow. So a couple of things like just come to mind. First was, I guess, what sort of news would you hear because... You know, this was back. You know, There's no real, you know, telephones and things this, like that nowadays. No, like, <laughs> no, and so, you, no. Yeah, so so I was just wondering. Like, um, I believe the, you know, it took almost two days for the official amount, announcement from yeah. the USSR saying, "Hey, there, there's an actually been an incident." Yes. So, so yeah, what sort of things would you hear before that, and then after that, I guess. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, you kind of like live in your little bubble. And you hear just the television. We didn't have social media back you know, yeah. 30 odd years ago. Yeah. There was none of that. So you would just take it from the news and the news kind of like in another language as well. So you're trying to, we mm. spoke German, but mm. you speak what you know is what you need in a ballet company. Yeah, so yeah. Like you're not going to really I mean? be uh, hearing, you know, radioactive particles in no. German. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> we, like weren't really, we weren't really aware. I just remember um, what, um, in that period where I was really deciding that it was time to move on, I actually went to a place called Kiel in far northern Germany. Mm. And I went to guest there as a, as a guest dancer for a, for a particular evening. And I remember the, there were protests in the streets. And that kind of... But again, you, you, when you dance in those theatres, you, you kind of just go to the city. You fly there, you go to the theatre, you do your dance, you do your, your work, you go back to the hotel and you leave. But I remember just, I felt this sense of, I don't know, frustration and anger and give us some truths, what's mm. really happened here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but once, once I, once I realised that it was, it, was, it was really quite serious, it was time to move on. It was really, I, I just didn't hesitate. And I was only quite young. I was only 25 at the time yeah. with, a, with, a, with a new family. So I was kind of making these huge decisions in my life. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, you heard enough on the radio. Uh, the, there's like the, the, uh, the American Forces radio was there as well that we used to listen to. And it was just, but we'd, we felt that the, that the, like the German government, they we didn't really give us that much information. It was like, yeah, we'll be, we'll be kind of okay. It's just sweeping it under the carpet. Mm. But yeah, and that and you know that's sort of secondhand as well because this was still in the time of you know the Berlin Wall was yes, still there, so absolutely know, was, the USSR was was still the Iron Curtain. You absolutely. really know what's not you not know what's going knew, on. So you never knew what was really going on. Yeah. So yeah. If, if you had to compare it, so I guess um you know with uh it's hard to get that that level of fear. Uh, Juan and I were talking about this recently. There's no real word for like a public fear or a collective fear. Yeah. Um. How would you have compared it to maybe like what was happening with the coronavirus, for example? Was there any similarities between those two? I suppose there was. I hadn't actually really thought about that. But I think, I, 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 I think being an Australian and having the opportunity to actually leave, I think that there's a quiet panic, but they can't do anything. Mm, they yeah. have to stay there. Yeah. We had the opportunity. I had my little Australian passport there. We all had. So it, I, I, I didn't have to panic and no i've got to stay here i was like i'm getting us out of here right now yeah so as yeah. soon as we made that decision you know we were just we were gone yeah because so, um how far actually is ukraine from, you know, from germany i'm not 100 percent. I, I, I know the you. i know the uh the hour difference i think is is one hour so you know time zone wise it's it's only one hour in in, in the future i think i don't so. know if it's something like i don't know why i think this like 15 1800 k's yeah something like that like yeah. from here to melbourne sort of thing yeah exactly I suppose. yeah so it's, it's not that far <laughs> not really, really no it's no. not really that far but i suppose we didn't allow ourselves we, we were once we made the decision to leave we were just full on in just getting ourselves out of the country as mm. far as we didn't have time to panic as such once we made that decision we knew we would be home but yeah. i had to get rid of an apartment and a car and just just all the practical things you know yeah yeah for sure um 
And you were in Dusseldorf? Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf yeah. was it? So um, how much did you, I guess, feel the difference between the, that divide in Germany at the time that was you know, still there between East and West Berlin, for yeah, example? Yeah, it was funny. I went to, um, back in 1983, I, I was invited to go over to the East, to East Germany to dance. Mm. And the one thing that I remember, I arrived at Berlin and you, 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 you cross over the border. I remember going from color to black and white. Wow. That was something that was so clear for me and just dismal. Yeah. Very, very, very dismal. Um, the women in the, in, the, in the theater who looked after us in the theater, uh, as far as costumes and all of that sort of stuff, I remember these women almost bowing and scraping to us. It was a very strange thing. And I remember eating in a restaurant um, and these just, oh, it was awful actually. These people looking at me like they're walking by and you could just feel that their, their desire to come in and have a meal like that. It was, it was a weird, I, but I do remember very black and white and bleak, extremely bleak. Yeah. 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 It's, um, poverty like that. And, um, it's, it's pretty rough. Like I traveled through South America or Central America mm. for some parts. And yeah, there are just parts where it's you know you know there's there's nothing you can do no, as an individual, no. and um, you know it's it's sort of good in a way, like it opens your eyes and you see yeah. you know trying not to yes. take things for granted. And I actually I've just remembered now I had a couple of that the theatre gave me a couple of tickets for the performance that night, of which I had nobody there. I was just there by myself. So I remember I went into the street and actually gave a couple of tickets, and they were just. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, they said, there's a performance tonight. I don't need them. Would you like them? Yeah, and I remember this, this just this shock that these people were given tickets to the theater that yeah, night. You know? Yeah, yeah, wow, that that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, there's some amazing experiences. And like they, for instance, they gave me, they paid us um, very very poorly in in West German marks, but they gave us a whole heap of East German marks that you co- that you couldn't bring over to the West. It was worth nothing. Yeah, yeah. but I went out and I bought them a beautiful like crystal glass that I st- we still drink from at home all jewelry and bits and pieces for my wife and beautiful sets of crystal glasses and all that sort of stuff you know with the, yeah that were worth actually quite a bit of money but in 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 uh, in west germany you know nothing worth nothing so. yeah 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 i mean that that sort of whole time era of history is fascinating and oh. um there's um, actually one of our sort of most popular book reviews or videos that we've done has been on the, the Gulag Archipelago. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's really heavy reading wow. and it yes. gets you that if, yeah, if you want something to really compare to, you know, how, how lucky we have it, that's, yes. that's the, the oh, way to go. God, we have it. We always knew, I mean, we always knew living in Europe. We lived for 15 years in Europe. We were 10 years in Germany and five years in Switzerland. Mm. And as much as we had a fantastic time, I mean, it was just wonderful. My, you know, it was great for my career. Our children were born there and they, uh, like they, they were then studied in German and, and in Switzerland later mm-hmm. on. But we always knew we came from the lucky country. We always knew we would come back home. It was just not a, it was never a point that we were going to stay over there. Yeah, know? yeah. Actually, I was, I was going to save this for a bit later, but we're already talking about it. So, so just traveling it and I I guess like what what made australia home in essence because you I'll, I'll list a couple of places you went germany switzerland obviously you live there mm. but italy monaco mexico south africa spain france taiwan japan england us you've, you've been pretty much everywhere uh, kind of went it's probably yeah. easier just to list the countries you haven't been yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, but i remember hearing you on a on another podcast and i'll, I'll just say this now um you were on the balanced ballerinas with, yes. with georgia um, yes where I uh, I first heard of you and yeah. I was like, wow, I, I actually want to speak, yeah. know a bit more of your story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What what actually made Australia home? Like, why was it so insistent? You were so insistent that you know. I think so many. I mean, this is a very general comment, but the majority of Australians end up coming back back to Australia, and I I remember dancing with with people in Amer- in um, uh, in in Europe, and they would always say, "What is it with you Australians? Why do you always yearn to go back home?" Mm. It's this. I think it's the. Somebody once said to me, "It's the sunshine. It's that sunshine and that sense of freedom that we have here." Mm it's hard to explain it's just i always knew when i left the australian shores i had a i wanted to go back i always wanted to go back to germany and switzerland and and, and those places but there was just this pang of like i'm i'm actually leaving my home yeah yeah and i i, I don't know i think it's the just the the openness of the people the the friendliness the 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 sun 
literally the sun you know we live when you live in germany you know you live a lot in it's <laughs> dark and it's cold and it's rainy and it's all of that you know yeah so it when i was dancing it never never kind of worried me because i just had the theaters it was harder for my wife when we moved around because i moved from country to country to work with particular choreographers i worked a lot with different choreographers so if they shifted from one theater or country and I was their dancer, I would shift also with them. Yeah. So for me, it was kind of easy. I just went from one theatre to, to the other. But my wife had to, you know, with children and everything, she had to find a whole new friendship band. Yeah. She had yeah. to, you know, there was in Switzerland, you moved down to the Swiss German. So the language is slightly different. And mm. for me, it was it was easy. But I always think what, what she had to also go through, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that whole family aspect. The I was, I was going to say I've sort of got a theory with regards to it, which is um, you, you can always sort of, almost sort of always fit in in Australia. Like I, I think yeah. you really have to have a um, you know there'd be something super special about you or a, a certain temperament not not to not to fit in. Yeah, fit in in a way because uh, everyone that I've met who um, I, when I was traveling with would be I guess long term ex expats, you yeah, know, ex expatriates. Yeah, there was always something. Um, it wasn't that they were moving to somewhere better. It was more they were getting away from something, like yeah. you know, whether it be the U.S. or Canada. Or there was yes. there was always something like I really dislike this one particular part about my country. Yes, I'm sort of going to yeah. leave. So yeah. I sort of feel like that might be something like that. It's you know, Australians are just so mellow. It's like I think <laughs> yeah, it's mellow, hard to be angry with us. Yeah, <laughs> no. And I, I remember we would always end. We tried to come back home every second year. Yep. to bring the children back just to reconnect with our families again. And um, my wife's sister and her husband, they lived at Alexandra Headland on the sunny coast. And they had a house that looked, you could kind of like, there was a water tower next to the house. And I remember going and sitting at this water tower every time when I was leaving because you saw the whole coast. And I remember just drinking in that that freedom on that space and that the beauty of the water and the beauty of the mm. landscape and all of that sort of stuff. Because I knew when I went back, I would often go back and you kind of felt like you were in a doll's house. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Everything's <laughs> like, everything's small and connected, contained. And even if when you get off at the German, you know, the Aussies, when you when you come in at the, at the international airport, g'day mate, how are you going? And you know, what are you doing here? But you hop off in Germany, passport bitter it's like <laughs> yeah. the, everything changes so it's you come into this very regimented way of of living i love it's not i loved i love the german people mm. and i love my my work my life there but it it is very regimented you know? yeah and just the language it's a harsh language yeah it's a yeah. hard language yeah i'm actually trying to learn german at the moment oh, um, so yeah. i'm I've got a got a little bit, and uh, it's actually why I wanted to learn it. I like the harshness. Oh, of really? It. It's a yeah. sort of uh, I, whenever I would meet a German, I'd be like, "They sound cool." <laughs> oh, really? You like yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, it's so, funny, isn't it? Um, I, I also speak um, Spanish pretty sort of uh, conversationally, almost fluently. Yes. So that's a bit more of a sing songy type yes, one. Yes, so yes, yes, yes. I want to try and mix it up yeah. with something a bit yeah. different. <laughs> like when I first when I first went to Germany, I had no idea, and actually not talented at it at all. Mm. I didn't really have a gift for languages, but my wife had, she had previously lived in Mon Monte Carlo for a year, so she had grasped French. French, French. So I think yeah. when, once you've got one language, you have a bit more confidence yeah. to go into the next one. For sure. I had no idea. So for me, it was just a gradual thing, you know. But you did, I found that you just got to go in there and just tr keep just trying it all the yeah. time. Some of the Aussies would go and do lessons and they got so, like, tongue-tied with dem di dem der das like yeah. how you should say things that they actually couldn't talk i just went in and made the mistakes but got myself understood you know? yeah for sure for sure oh, I've, I've made uh, plenty of mistakes in uh, yeah. in spanish and um yeah definitely knowing another one because you can sort of especially if they're linked ones you know maybe yes. maybe not knowing you know chinese and yeah romanian that yes. that might not help but yeah. um if it's a german word that doesn't have a direct translation to yes. english yeah it usually has something very close to in Spanish. So I'm yes. sort of like, oh, okay, I won't need to really remember that. Yes, yes, yes. Because it's yes. just that linking. Yeah. And, um, th you know, that's how people can learn yeah. 12 um, languages because uh, yeah. they've got, you know, 10 yeah. and they basically connection. almost speak yeah. it. It's yeah. just certain yeah. grammar and structure yeah. that you have to change. Yeah, when I first joined, when we first joined the company in Germany, there was um, in Dusseldorf, there was about 25 new um, dancers who joined, which is quite a lot of new, new dancers of 
all different nationalities. Mm. And they said, the, the, um, the administration said to us in the ballet masters, they said, we will speak your language to you for the first three months that you're here. But you've got to learn German. The the, the director was a, he was a German, because hmm. a lot of those companies over there they're run by Americans and Englishmen, and they're run by you know English speaking people. So English tends to become the, the language of the, of the company. Yeah. But this was a German. This is back forty. 42 years ago or something. So it was like very German run at that yeah, point. Yeah. So we had, and it was dead on three months and they only spoke German to us. Yeah. So yeah. you had to actually had to get in there and learn the language. Yeah, so wow. It was wow. Great. In that way, it was great though. I was very grateful for that because you can kind of go to those countries and just, it's very get easy by. to yeah. get by. But this, we had to kind of speak it. So. Yeah, that's awesome. What was it like having, um, you know, just so many nationalities sort of all packed in? Because mm-hmm. how often would you train per day? It'd be, Every day. Yeah. Well, we like you know, eight hour days, ten yeah, hour days, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. yeah, we would in the in the in the in those theaters in Germany. You start the you start the day at um, ten, you go till about about one thirty two, and then you break till about five five thirty, just depending on what's being rehearsed, and then you go till nine. Yeah, so it's a um, lot of hours. <laughs> it's a lot of hours. It's, yeah. it's a lot of hours. But I mean, you know, I always say it was it was never a job for me. Being a dancer was never, ever a job. I ran to work. I loved being a dancer. Yeah. I truly, from my heart, loved every moment of it. I loved being in the studio. I loved being with choreographers. I loved to train my body. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, was all, it was all I knew. I never, I never wanted anything else. So. Yeah, and, and so that uh, gets, uh, I suppose, a little bit into your backstory. So you're from um, Wagga Wagga in, yeah. in, in New South Wales. and. Yeah. Um, when was it that I guess you discovered dancing and um, that that passion? When did you know, like, I'm going to be a dancer? You know, it's really bizarre because my 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 dad. Um, this is back in the very early sixties. I, I was, as the story goes, I was four, and he had me in the bank in the Commonwealth Bank in Wagga Wagga in New South Wales, and I'm dancing around the place. It was all I just I moved, I yep. danced, and a woman said to him. Actually, it was a woman that my dad knew. He, my dad knew this lady's husband. And she said, oh, bring him to me. She was a dance teacher. She said, bring him to me. I'll, I'll get, some, get, get rid of some energy for you. <laughs> and I was four. And I, I just remember, I can still remember, I would start with tap dancing. So I started with my tap dancing. So I would re- just remember dying to get to that ballet studio, dying to get into that studio and just put my little tap shoes on and, and off I went. Yeah. So I only, I, I had, I think I had a natural feel for movement. I love to move. I, the music was a big motivation for me as well. So, um, yeah, I, 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 it sounds really cliched, but I was kind of meant, meant to dance. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how else to explain it. Once I got into that studio, I felt I felt like I was home. I felt like I meant to be here. Mm. And and you uh, put in, I guess, tremendous work to get there as well. Because uh, you, when did you start doing the ballet in Canberra? So yeah, I, I, well, I actually started ballet with with this particular teacher of mine, Beverly Beverly Waters, who now lives in Adelaide. And uh, I started ballet with her probably eleven. I don't even eleven. Yeah, it was eleven. And then. Um, she, her partner, uh, was an ex dancer from the Australian ballet, yep. and I was eleven. I was twelve, I think, that at that time. So to see this man come in and actually still be very physical, and st- he had just stopped dancing himself. So mm-hmm. he was, he was like, I couldn't believe yeah, my like eyes. A god. Oh, he was yeah. like a god yeah. in a way, yeah. To yeah. kind of see that's what I want to be like. Mm. So, um, yeah, so I had him for a year. He was a, quite a big influence. It was only one year that I really had him, but he was a very big influence. They obviously saw my talent. They left. So they then con- uh, contacted um, Brian Lawrence, who was a former principal of the Australian Ballet. And they contacted him, Robert, this man, um, man's name, Beverly's partner. His name was Robert. And Robert contacted Brian and said, I've got this boy. I think you should look at him. And I was 12 at the time. So um, they accepted me into the school. So I then used to travel to Canberra for every for three, three years. I was 13, 14, 15. And every weekend over that period, I would travel to Canberra, mm. um, which was about like uh, something like, I don't know, two and a half or three hours yeah, to get not, there. It's not easy. It's not just around trip, the yeah. corner. 
And I, the deal was is that if I, my mum and dad paid for my tuition and they paid me to get there, but I needed board. I needed someone to sort of look after me. Yeah. So uh, the families, I had about 15 different families from, from over those three years who had students at the school who used to take me in every weekend. Wow. Yeah. So it was an incredible period of, of learning communicative skills. There was a lot, so many different people that I would go and you know, stay with. Mm. So you, I just learned quick smart how to communicate to people and you know how to conduct myself i suppose in different family areas mm. and that'd be perfect training for you know joining a ballet where you've got 12 different nationalities oh that's exactly and, right it yeah. was wonderful and so i've had some people over the years say to me oh, oh you poor thing like you must have you lost your childhood i was like mm. no i was in heaven yeah. i couldn't wait for friday to come yeah so i would leave it about like mid morning i'd get my, my transport a bus or train or um, my dad used to fly me. I think if he had a win at the races, he'd fly me down there. Yeah, yeah. So I would go down there. And you wouldn't do it now, but I used to have just a little blue carry bag that I used to just walk around the streets of Canberra in yeah. and get a bus and go to my ballet studio, go to my ballet class, mm. get there at about probably four in the afternoon, dance till about eight or nine. That was Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, get back on the bus at about, I think, seven at night or something like that, be home at about midnight, mm. and then the whole thing started all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, definitely wouldn't uh, be uh, acceptable nowadays, really, to see kids walking around just, you know. No, you wouldn't do it now. You wouldn't. I mean, my mum and dad, you know, I don't know whether it was just a trust. I don't know. I remember being, you know, 13, they put me on a train from by myself mm. from Wagga to Sydney, and I, I wanted to go and see a particular ballet performance. And they knew nothing about ballet. They kind of trusted me. My mum and dad were incredible people. They didn't understand ballet. They didn't understand dancing. Mm. But they kind of knew they had this kid who had this passion. I think my poor dad was like, what have I got here? <laughs> my dad loved his yeah. footy and his yeah. mates. And he's got a kid who wants to be a bloody ballet dancer. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. But they were incredibly supportive of me. You know? yeah. Unbelievable. They never really understood what I did. But they were very supportive. I think my dad, um, I once danced for Princess, Princess Grace and Prince Rainier in, in Monaco mm. when I was quite young. I think I was only 18 or 19 or something like that. And for my dad, I remember he, he went down to the club, he went down to the local uh, leagues club apparently, and my son's dance for royalty. <laughs> and and like, that for him was a big thing. Yeah, you know? It was course, very, very funny. It was very, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. You had that, um, that, I suppose, support network from you know immediate family, which is Fantastic. probably the most critical thing. I had wonderful aunties who helped me. You know, my mum and dad were mum and dad were terrific, but I had to be kind of sometimes you know shipped to Canberra for separate for different kind of performances where I needed to be there for a week or two. So some of my mum, my mum and my and some of my aunties would go down, and we would all stay in a hotel together, and hmm. so it was a real family uh, affair, if you like. You yeah, know? it was yeah. it was a it was a wonderful time. I was very lucky. I had huge support because I was I was extremely bullied as a kid yeah, in the, in the yeah. 60s and the early 70s just not people not having any idea what I what I wanted to do and I was different I granted mm. I was not your normal kid it was, it was kind of funny at the same time I, I was a champions athlete and swimmer and played soccer mm. but people still couldn't deal with the whole ballet thing it was just so not accepted yeah yeah and so, so um, yeah I wanted to touch on that if, uh, if that's okay with you which was yeah um, I suppose, w w what do you think about it was that, that would draw that, that um, it, just the difference? Like you, you're, you're spending so much time doing all these other things, so you're not... And I think they felt, it's weird, I knew, I knew at 11, 12, 13, 14, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Mm. I, I, I had such a clear vision of what I needed, what I needed to do, and I have a feeling that was kind of a threat mm, yeah, to that, a lot of people. Almost that confidence, or yeah. that, yeah. I hated school. I would, I would do things like, like I was really badly bullied, and I, I don't think I learned as well. I don't think I'm a stupid sort of person, but I, I didn't learn as well as I could have because I was actually traumatized, mm. and it, you know that mental health wasn't even spoken about. 45 years ago 50 yeah. years ago toughen up was would just, probably be yeah, the best just advice just deal with it no yeah. no no one was there to kind of say, i don't think mum and dad quite knew they could see me really probably not dealing with things well i used to be very just in my room all the time listening to music and i didn't actually know how to form friendships I didn't really understand what it was like to have mates or friends because nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. I was kind of the last one to be in school and the last one to and the first one to leave. I just wanted to get in and out as quickly as I possibly 
as I could. Yeah. Um, and I just remember them like it was never kind of one. It was always the older boys. And there was for some reason they would get me, they would gang up on me and punch and kick and get me on the ground. And then they and then I remember walking on a on a stairwell at the school and they'd all stand there and collectively spit on me. Yeah. Awful. So but I kind of just I used to think, um, Paul, you've just got to get through this. Mm. You've just got to get because you, my goal was like so driven at that early age, I just knew I had to push through this period in my life. I was not meant to be in Wagga. Yeah. I was definitely not meant to be in Wagga. And I yeah. knew that. And I kind of accepted that. I was look, I had a wonderful family, fantastic family, but I know I was not meant to be there. I was I was meant to go to the city and learn ballet and wherever I whatever in a bigger place. Yeah, you for know? sure. Yeah. Um like that's a awful story to hear, but and um you know, that still, I guess, happens nowadays as well. Like as much as we, it's, it's almost something that's innate in, in kids as well. Yeah. Um, my mum and dad were, were high school teachers and my dad would, um, would always tell me like, it's, you know, it, he would, he was a high school teacher for 30 something years. So he, he saw pretty much everything that goes on. Um, and it was yeah not restricted to, to any particular person like no. the, the, the mob, I guess would yeah. and, and and individuals as well, mm. but they if if you got selected, like it would yeah. be you got selected. Yeah. Like there was no there was, was no um, you know rhyme or reason to it no. as well. And and for for guys and girls as well, he would, yeah. he would actually say um, the girls would be almost worse than the yeah. guys in a way because they yeah. they you know they they have the I guess a bit more of a maturity, so yeah. they would. Not physically hurt yeah. the no, other girls, no, but psychologically, no, like no, damaging. Very damaging. damaging. Yeah. And I kind of, I mean, I'm 60 now, and I still kind of, kind, there's always a little, there's little cracks in me. Mm. And, and you can't really, hear, I mean, I don't need any kind of help or support or anything like that. It's nothing like that. But there is a little, little cracks in me sometimes you know, yeah. that, come, that come through. Yeah. And one thing that I used to do that used to help me tremendously was i used to write my name thousands and thousands of times i wish i'd have kept the books mm. and i just write and i have quite an elaborate signature now and that name my, i knew my name no one wanted to know me then i was just this weird kid who wanted to be a ballet dancer but i knew deep down that someday someone would want me to sign a program I kind of went that far yeah, into it. Yeah. I knew that I, my name was going to be in a program and I know that one day I'm going to be at a stage door somewhere and someone's going to hand me a program and I'm going to sign it. Yeah. And then they're going to want to know who I who was that dancer on the stage. Yeah. So that was one thing that I kind of helped me. I think was simply my name. My name was my strength. Mm. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about that in particular because I, I can sort of see how that would be a, you know, both a fantastic, I guess, coping mechanism, mm. but also could potentially lead you into some dangerous areas further down the track where potentially, you know, you're really focused on making a name for yourself, mm. I guess, you know, making your name well known mm. and then almost chasing fame in a way, which, yeah. you know, when people tend to do that, that doesn't really end no. up so great. So I just wanted to, to uh, maybe dive a bit deeper into that and, mm. and see, you know, how do you feel that really, really helped you in a way? And like, did you... Um, I guess almost change it as you got older and maybe it wasn't needed as much. No, absolutely. I think it got me through that period. Mm. I think it got me really through that period. When I used to go to Canberra, I was in heaven yeah, yeah. because I was with like-minded people who just who all wanted to be a dancers and, and there was a few guys there as well. So I kind of felt like, that. The, oh, okay, I'm not the only one here wanting to be a ballet dancer. Mm. There were other men who actually, a lot of those men went on to have, they were mates of mine who went on to become you know, principal dancers of the Australian ballet and danced all, all over the world. Yeah. So it was nice to have that like-minded thing. I think... I think that that period of me, like with my name, that was simply to get me through that period of my life. Yeah. I think my very kind of humble background with, in Wagga mm. brought me down to earth. Like I was never, I was never one to to kind of I chase fame. I I was extremely grateful. I I kind of knew, I kind of knew, 
that I just I wanted just to be a dancer. I didn't actually at that time when I was kind of a kid, I didn't have great aspirations. I don't think to be I have to be a principal dancer. I just wanted to be a dancer. I just wanted to be in a ballet company. Mm. And then once I got to Europe and I realized that a lot of people wanted to start to work with me, that's when I knew that I had I did have a pathway. A pathway was kind of paved for me to be able to actually become a principal dancer. Yeah. Yeah. And um I had some I had probably a half a dozen mentors really really good people in my career who just guided me there was uh, there was one man where, I'll just go back to when yeah, I was yeah, for sure, for to sure. when I was in Melbourne at the Australian Ballet School when I was after I left Canberra I, then at 16 I left home and I went down to the Australian Ballet School and at that stage um Sir Robert Helpman who was a very famous older Australian actually from uh, from Mount Gambia I think he was okay, but he yeah. went on and had a he's since passed away obviously he'd be a very old man now mm. but he he had a huge career in in London very famous Australian with Michael Edgeley Michael Edgeley was a very famous entrepreneur who used to bring out different shows and all that sort of stuff when I was 16 Edgeley and Helpman bought out what they called Stars of World Ballet and that was a um that was a like a they got literally the greatest stars of the world in ballet companies at that time the Royal Ballet Stuttgart in Germany Japan America England they got the top yeah. and they toured with them so they came this group of probably off the top of my head might have been 20 dancers big stars came out to uh, all the major cities and as a student as a 16 year old student i went down out to the palais theater in melbourne every night to go and see these dancers we got like cheap tickets to go out and see it. and i was just you know you're in awe because you, you want to kind of do what they're doing at that level you know mm. and there was a man there called peter breuer and Peter was a very big, imposing, very handsome sort of guy, big man. And um, he, he just left this impression on me. You know, wow, like that's a really big bloke doing these amazing type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Fast forward, I'm 16. Fast forward three years, I'm in Düsseldorf. And he is a guest principal with the company. He sees me. He takes me under his wing. And he coaches me. He actually choreographs for me. He's very he and he danced all over the world. He used to, his life. He used to wake up in Munich, rehearse in Düsseldorf, and perform in London. <laughs> wow, <laughs> like insane life. Yeah, he yeah. had an insane life, Peter. And he actually could have chosen anybody basically in the world to have done it but he somehow he saw something in me that was special and he choreographed this this piece for for he and i yeah. so i was probably 21 to something like that at the mm -hmm. time and i used to fly down to munich down to his home and to i, I would he, he would choreograph some in, sometimes in Düsseldorf, sometimes in munich so i used to travel around like like just book a flight to munich and to stuttgart and all all those places and he um he would invite me to go to all these different cities around the world to do this oh, no sorry not around the world but around europe around germany and switzerland to dance this particular part of it. he i have my career he becomes a director um he calls i i hear about probably five years ago that he has been he is um He's probably seventy now at the, at that at this stage. He's he's getting a huge prize in Germany, and I thought, you know what, I really want to go. He was such a huge influence on in my life. I want to surprise him. So I made the appropriate phone calls, not to him. Yeah. And I, long story short, I flew over to Germany, and I surprised him. And little did I know, but that I had no idea of this. But that night of that big. Um, celebration for him <laughs> I opened the program and there's this picture of me in there me and him from 34 years ago <laughs> <laughs> and they're dancing that putter de that he did for me all those decades ago yeah it yeah. was like this is wild you know yeah. it was just those fantastic moments in your life when you come together with all those people and it was just a wonderful period in my life you that's know? amazing did you know so you you mentioned you're, you're quite young you know 21 um, yeah did you know how special it was at the time that you're you know this is something so unique you know not many people ever are going to experience something like this no i i did i never took it for granted and i because i you know it was funny i was saying to somebody that not that long ago my desire to dance was oh sorry was far greater than my talent mm. 
So what I had to do is that I had to push, because I expected this of myself when my talent was actually here. Mm. So I had to work like a dog to make sure that I reached that level of dancing ability to be able to know, to reach what I knew I could, what I wanted to do with mm. my life. Yeah, you know. So I never took it for granted. Like, oh yeah, this is great. This should happen to me ever, ever, my whole career. Mm. I knew, I knew I was extremely lucky to have what I had. I never took it for granted. Yeah, I think that uh, that aspect of, I guess you'd call it the grind, yeah. is essential in keeping someone humble because, oh, yeah. yeah, just getting by on talent um, is. Uh, you know, this is just no. a, a, a small a small one no. for me, but there's a guy at the calisthenic park I, I train with um, and he's just like a naturally talented dude. He can yeah. do all these crazy things. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, he takes it for granted because yeah. it's it's just easy yeah. for him. Um, and uh, you were mentioning before about, you know, those special instances of, of someone either, you know, just physically doing something in front of you or taking you under their wing if they're, yeah. if they're very generous. Um, yeah. But I met a, a hand balancer called Miguel Santana who is just amazing. You know, one arm handstands for, you know, five minutes at a time, just doing all these, Good guy. The, the control. And I, um, I met him in person just here in Brisbane. It was like a random Thursday afternoon, just me and him there. Yeah. And just seeing this guy do his stuff just made me go, wow, like I want to do that someday. That's That's what I want to do. So, uh, wow. Yeah, Amazing. that's a you know that's a sort of put uh, the next seven years of my life into uh, <laughs> you know one hour two hours a day yes. of doing that wow, to, to get really? to that level. So, wow. um, but uh, I, I really want to do it. So you know, let's see if I can. <laughs> wow. It's amazing those people have such an influence on you. Yeah, yeah, and it was just you know I, I met him so briefly. Um, yeah. I, I did chat with him on the podcast um, for you know half an hour, but my wow. my whole interaction with him was probably two or three hours max wow. but it's you know that's a uh, influenced me so wow. so deeply um, okay. did you did you have uh, many more people like that and i life? had I was, it just comes to mind i i there was a very famous american ballerina principal ballerina called joyce cuoco and i'd heard of this woman like she's really like super funny had r- unbelievable technical ability like freaky could stand on her point shoes and just turn. Her thing was she could turn and balance. It was like, you know, normally <laughs> yeah. normally you can do four or five. She would be doing 13, 14. Oh like it God. was something like, <laughs> it was something ridiculous. So I was actually in Berlin dancing through Peter. Like the connection is like crazy. Through Peter, when I first, he first started to invite me to go, he would call entrepreneurs these people who were putting on these big galas in all these different cities throughout Germany and he said look I've got a young guy for you I think you need to bring him on board so that was me so I, I went I was dancing one night in Berlin and just before the, the the curtain went up my partner a German girl fell over so I couldn't dance because I didn't have a partner to dance with. This very famous woman, Joyce Cuoco, came to me that night and said, oh, you poor... She was just so sweet. She said to me, oh, you poor thing, I'll dance with you. <laughs> I was like, you don't want to dance with me. I'm just a dumb, silly kid, you know. She, I, I understood the gravity of how huge she was. And she said, no, 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 no. we'll dance tomorrow night. So lo and behold, this woman gets me into the, into the, on the stage the next day and it was a sleeping beauty, of like a very famous... Um, traditional classical pas de deux, Sleeping Beauty pas de deux from Act 3 and Sleeping Beauty. So lo and behold, within 24 hours, I find myself, this young, I don't know what I was, 20 or something at the time, on stage with this extremely famous woman. Mm. And I was, as I was, very lucky to be there and I hope quite humble and thankful towards her. And she said, I like you. We're going to work together one day. (laughs) Fast forward, fast forward, Eight years, something like that. I find myself in a company in Germany where she's a guest and she only wanted to dance with me. Yeah. So I ended up, her, her husband was a choreographer and her husband, I, 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 my wife and I would change cities and countries to go and work with him and she was my partner. Yeah, yeah. So she believed in me so, so much. I, 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 I think, I, don't, I truly, and I don't mean this any sort of false modesty, but it was not the fact that I was such a great, good dancer, great dancer. I think it was the fact that my work ethic was just 
so strong, I would I would move heaven and earth to do what these people wanted me to do for them. Yeah. So I think in the end product, I never had to audition any anymore for anything. It was all by word of mouth. Mm. And it was really because I think I, I wanted it so bad and I wanted so bad to be as best I could. I did whatever I was kind of told, for sure. you know. For sure. So Joyce was a huge influence on my life. Her and Yuri, this partnership. And it was just they gave me ballets that I never, ever, ever dreamt in my life I would ever have the privilege to dance. Mm. I, I, I danced his um, – I danced the role of Spartacus. Now, if you look at me, I'm not really Kirk Douglas. You yeah, know? not, not uh, brimming at I'm the – I'm not this big, <laughs> big, tall, I'm quite short. I've got everything, small hands, sort of kind of short arms. And you kind of think of those 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 – but those um, roles as these being these big. I had Kirk Douglas in my head, yeah. you know, like big. So I almost went to the to the director and said, "I think you've made a really big mistake here." And I thank God I didn't because I en- it ended up being a role that I danced all over the world in all countries all over the world, mm. and I danced this this ballet with Joyce, and I ended up dancing. There's a very famous um, arena in it's two thousand year old arena in Verona in Italy. And uh, it was the Arena di Verona, and there was a very, very famous um, opera festival that had a ballet in this whole festival. So I landed myself eight performances in Verona. I had they had a beautiful apartment in Verona while I was putting the ballet, while I was there rehearsing the ballet. Mm. And I'll never forget. Have you ever been there to this this place? To, to your, no, I haven't been to Europe okay. personally. No. It's 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 like a mini coliseum, but it's actually it. It holds 20,000 people. There's the stage is um, 50 metres wide, like a normal set. Like the Lyric Theatre here, I think about 16. Yeah, yeah this is huge. 50 yeah. by 30 deep with a 125-piece orchestra. And you, I knew that when I was dancing on this stage in this, in this environment, those gladiators actually fought there. My dressing room was in the bowels yeah. of this place. You were kind of walking in dirt under there, so it was uh, it was very very um, primitive, just yeah, visceral, yeah, that, very. Yeah. So when I was there, it, I'll never forget it. That was the most unbelievable feeling to dance that role like a gladiator yeah. in that environment <laughs> where you know two thousand years prior. The, the, the gladiators were and on the very very last performance which was the last performance of the whole um, uh, opera season it's all outdoors and the performances don't start until eight, 9, at, nine and 10 at night because they've got to wait for the sun to go down and the, the stage to cool mm. um, and this on the very last night we were told if it rains immediately leave the stage because the orchestra they, the rain will affect their instruments so we got halfway through the second act and you heard the rumbling of the thunder and the lightning and it was like we're dancing this very dramatic ballet and all this you could feel the clouds like yeah rrr. yeah the moisture in the air that it was yeah. unbelievable and it started to you just felt the rain and i said to joyce as we were dancing we leave or we leave. She said, keep dancing, keep dancing. <laughs> so the orchestra, God bless the orchestra and God bless that conductor, he actually finished the score. We had probably another five minutes to go of the whole ballet, but he kept the whole thing going. So yeah. Yeah. it was like the gladiators was roaring down at us, you know, <laughs> in that environment. It was am- so like those sort of envi- that sort yeah. of experiences, you know, were just amazing. Yeah, just kind of encapsulate that. Well, um- were any of your ballets uh, like recorded or, or filmed or anything like that? Is yeah, it, is it possible yeah, to find them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have the. Uh, I I've got them at home, sort of. of course, you yeah, can't yeah, really yeah. go on YouTube or anything. I think there's one thing you can get them in YouTube. I think I, I don't really. I, yeah, I yeah. yeah. I, I had a bit of a look, but I didn't really uh, come up with anything. No, no. There's nothing. It's all too long ago. So, and a lot of the, a lot of the things. Are they on like VHS or? <laughs> yeah, gotta be careful. With those. I've got to, got to get them changed over. I keep on saying I've got to get them changed over because the rules are very difficult over there. You can't just get um, recordings because of the orchestras. Mm. The orchestras won't allow it out. But I had very good people who just kind of snuck some things out. Yeah. To me, so yeah. you know, well, that's fantastic that you can have those memories as well yeah. and, and see those things. Um, I really wanted to touch upon uh, discipline as well. So you're, you're talking about you know the hard work and, and what's required. Did it, um, I suppose uh, the, the question I want to ask is, you know, you would probably still have those days where it's, you know, you wake up, you're tired, you're, 
you know, your knees hurting, whatever it is, what sort of mindset would you get into to, to keep going on, on those sorts of days? When I was a dancer? Yeah, yeah. I used to wake up, for instance, from Spartacus, I, when I would dance that, and I used to wake up in, in the morning and feel like a train had rolled over me. Mm. My body hurt. It physically hurt. Um, but I, I don't know. I just knew... I, I was I was extremely disciplined. Like nothing was going to kind yeah. of like I would never ring and say, "Oh, I just can't today. I'm a bit sick or a bit sore." Mm. It was like that's just what it is as a dancer. You are all you are you are never comfortable as a dancer. So you grow up with that. You grow up knowing that your body's always going to basically hurt. Mm. So yeah. you, you have to. Um, it depends on the ballet that you're dancing. Sometimes it's much worse than others. But I was basically tired all the time. Yeah, I was basically tired and sore all the time. So I was disciplined. I worked. I, I just knew I needed to go and stretch my body. Mm -hmm. I, needed, I knew I needed to, to to look after. I ate very well. I never drank a lot. I love a glass of wine and a beer. But I, I never ever ever abused my. I never took any substances that I knew were going to in any way affect my body yeah. ever ever yeah. still don't no. so that 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 part of the discipline that was just for me my, my body was my body was my instrument so i'm not going to get the violin and smash the violin against the or bang on the piano so mm. my body i had to treat my body with a lot of respect and i think that was just that was just part of my my, my daily discipline i had my routine you know i would always get to the theater um i would never ever just get to the theater with an hour to spare you know it was always depending on the role at least two hours before two and a mm. half hours sometimes yeah to get ready the, my discipline of of where um you set the makeup up so where the brushes were where where was the powder where everything had to be in it where it where it needed to be so that if there was an emergency i or whenever i teach now i always say to them if you if you go in and you have everything placed where it needs to be and there's an emergency in the show and you need you need a black needle and thread i used to have all my needles and threads there in case something i needed to do that i wasn't <gasps> panicked by it yeah so yeah. Um, self self preparation was really the um was was the kind of the gift in a way i gave myself to be to be prepared for everything for sure for sure you know? I, I think you touched upon um it was it was almost like not letting yourself uh think too much about it as well so you know that, that's one of the things I, I think i'm sort of starting to realize is uh when i struggled maybe a little bit when i was younger in my teens um you know i would sort of some like body issues things like that um and i knew what i needed to do to to get better um but i would be able to talk my way out of it in mm -hmm. my own head Whereas I think it's it's almost I always say it's sort of like, like making yourself become stupid in a way. Like yeah. You, there's a, a switch you flick, and yeah. it's like no. Yeah. Now it's yeah. You know I'm going to that yeah. workout session at yeah. 7 p.m. Whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. But it, it yeah. goes like I go there and do that. And I knew the career short. Like I, I I knew I danced actually till I was I was about two weeks off my 43rd birthday when okay. I stopped yeah. dancing. Yeah. So I danced really really long, but I knew it was basically a short career. So I didn't have time to make make um, excuses. Yeah, I wanted it, and, and then it came just back to I wanted it so bad. I, it was like a drug in that way. I I had to have it, and I had to do it for as long as I possibly could. I actually had to get even more disciplined as I got older, because mm. you know, in each decade, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, you start to feel it more and more. <laughs> the thirties, yeah. the thirties, and then once I hit forty, and I still I still could train with all the young boys, with the young guys. Yeah. Like I used to train properly with the company because I knew that if I went in there and just went, oh, look, I'll be right, you know, I can't be bothered training today, that it just it falls apart, the body crumbles. Mm. So I had no choice. If I wanted to keep at that at that um, pinnacle, at that level, yeah. I knew I had to train. It's like an athlete. It's like you know anybody at the top of their game. You you can't you can't take it for granted. Yeah, you you are so nowadays you you teach a lot of kids as well with the Queensland Ballet. Do you think that um, you know wanting it so bad can that be taught in a way? Is it, no. or is it, it? It's just got to be an no. innate no. thing. No, yeah, you cannot teach that. And the older I get, and the more I teach, the more I realise. I, it's funny. There's another fantastic man that I work with um, at Queensland Ballet, and he and he saw me frustrated one day, and he said, "Paul, it's like fishing." I said, "How so, Vin?" He said, "You throw the line in, some will bite, some won't. You go with the ones who want to bite. If the ones who don't want to bite." You don't bother about them. Mm. You can't. You can't make somebody want this. Yeah, yeah. There's no way you can encourage them, 
and you can teach them skills, but deep in your guts, you've got to have a desire to want this. Because I keep on saying to them, the people that I work with, you are, oh, I'm tired. Yeah, you're going to get used to it because you're going to be constantly tired. Mm. You're going to be constantly sore. You're never going to be comfortable as a dancer. It just doesn't, a good one. Mm. You might just have that go in and do 50% and somehow get away with it. But if you, if you desire to be really great at what you do, you are going to be always sore and tired. Get yeah. used to it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. tough like that. Yeah. I'm that old school, you know, like, come on, just let's move on with it. Yeah. If you want it bad enough, you will push through all those adversities, mm. you know. Yeah, so, so you were saying, you know, you, you're waking up every day, you're tired and whatnot. Um, what what's sort of a, I guess like the end stage of a of a ballet dancer or how, um, how would you say a, a, a ballerina? Or, no, um, yeah, just, <laughs> just like a male ballet dancer, da- dancer noble. Dancer, is, they yeah, they yeah. kind of look at and the, the noble dancer, yeah. but ballerina is really and that it's funny because that word ballerina is very much thrown about. Mm. But a ballerina is actually the principal yeah, yeah. dancer of that. Yeah. You know, but for a man, I would always say just a, a principal male. Yeah. Ballet dancer. Okay. Um, so, for people when they're, you know, I guess retired and and they get into, you know, the the later stage of their life. So, you know, you're saying you went to mid forties almost. So yeah. that that later stage, um, what what do dancers um, physically end up happening to them? Are they, you know, longevity wise, does this have an impact? The working so hard in your mm. in your youth does that have an impact for the later stage of your mm, life? Because you'll find some people they they really have some chronic injuries, yeah, yeah, but they never some bone injuries as well that they didn't really look after. Hip yeah. replacements, all that sort of stuff. Knee replacements later on in their life, they they kind of have to have. That's why now we have medical teams in all the big ballet companies around the world. There's there's always a medical team there to kind of advise what so that the dan- what is right, what is not right, so that they can have longevity to their career. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I don't suffer really that much i mean i'm 60 i still teaching i mean i can't anymore demonstrate like i obviously that i even could five years ago Mm -hmm. the body changes and there's no need to for me to do that anymore i don't need to do that anymore but um i had i had in my life i had three knee operations um so there's not a lot of elasticity in my left knee anymore that Mm -hmm. doesn't really work as well as i don't hobble or anything like that but there's just certain things that i can't i can't sit on my haunches for instance that i haven't been doing that for 30 years yeah so um i never personally suffered but i do know some people who who have had you know knees and and hip replacements and all that sort of stuff yeah but i think i think if you i think if you're just active i think a lot of you'll see a lot of people dancers who were very active in their dancing years they still they are still active and i think that's a big trick yeah to keeping on top yeah. of it so know? so it's not necessarily the you know almost the work that was done it was it was more the the later stage you know once what do you do once you if you're tired are you yeah you know, so i'm mean, just sitting on the couch getting into bad habits and yeah i like think that. it's like anybody whether you're yeah. a dancer or no matter what you did with your life i think i think act, being active is a very important part of, of getting older is keeping everything moving keeping it mobile and active you know so yeah for sure, for sure. Yeah, but I mean, I know a lot of dancers, ex-dancers, who you know they they can leave the profession and not and not not yearn for it anymore. I mean, I never ever thought of doing anything else. I just knew I was destined to continue on. All that I had learned over the years should be passed on. Um, it was no use to me anymore. And now that I'm actually choreographing a lot as well for Queensland Ballet, so that for the for the academy a lot. So that's that's a wonderful outlet for me. I love that part of my job. Mm. Yep. So, um, yeah, you're, you're teaching now. Do you see uh, much of a difference between, I guess, the, the current generation and compared to maybe the generation you came up with in terms of, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know, what, what differences you, you could potentially see there? We were tougher. Yeah. <laughs> Dare I say that. We were tougher. I, th- I think, look, I think, I think it's a throwaway society. Mm. And I think I think dancers. I think a lot of uh, not everybody, but there are, there are a lot of people out there who like we. You got a credit card. I can have whatever. Basically, I can have whatever I want. I can go into town and buy a two hundred dollars shirt if I want, and I can have that shirt now. Yeah, I can have whatever I basically want within my means now. Yeah. And I think this is what happens to this younger generation now. They know they can find, got, we've got iPhones, and they just press a couple of buttons 
and they, they can find exactly what they want. Have they got the memory to hold on to it? No, not really, because they know all they've got to do is press a button again. I don't know. I, I find that they, um, the retention rate is not what it was, to yeah. be honest with you, because I think this generation is so used to having quick fix information yeah. that they, they don't retain things as best. Mm. And I just think... No, I said to them actually not that long ago, I said, you know, no, no matter how much technology we have in the world, we can fly any well, not at the moment, but we can, we can travel, we can do unbelievable things. I said, but the thing with a dancer is that it's, whether it's now or 100 years ago, you've still got to walk into the studio, warm your body up, Learn, learn piece by piece of putting the jigsaw puzzle together as a dancer. You're never just going to wake up and it's going to be there, or take a pill and it's going to be there. Mm. So I think that 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 desire to to um, care about intricacies of your work and detail of the work that that for some is that they don't understand delayed gratification. It's an mm. instant gratification. Yeah. So dancers will always still have to go through that, 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 that avenue, if you like, of pulling things apart and putting it properly into place because you don't just wake up and you do it. Okay. And I think it's difficult for the, for the younger society today because they're just used to having everything at their Yeah, Yeah, I mean, like, if, if you think about your own story, you know, saying, writing your name down a thousand times, one day looking in the future, that far in the future... That, that's a very hard skill to develop. And yeah. it's, it's um, you know, there's so many tests. And you, I think in the social sciences, probably one of the main rock solid ones is, you know, delayed gratification yeah. equals success yes. relatively. Yes. You know, depends how you define success. Yes. But um, yeah. that and uh, it's it's sort of, uh, I was saying as well, it's, um, stoicism is, is sort of making a comeback nowadays, yeah. which is <laughs> almost... Uh, yeah. Uh, voluntary deprivation in a way. Yeah. And it's it's funny how taking away some freedoms actually can, you know, make things better for yourself. So it's uh yes. that's uh yeah, that that's quite interesting um, I hearing was that. I'm always as well. grateful yeah. if I look back on my life now, I'm grateful for what didn't happen, for when I struggled. Mm. When there were periods in my life when there was really like, oh, really? Yeah, am, am I gonna have to go through that? I look back on it now and I'm grateful because I had I had comparisons. When things didn't go exactly as I had planned, yeah, and I had to fight and make sure that I, I got myself back on that track, I appreciated it so much. So I always say to the young people that I work with now, appreciate when things – don't want it all to happen like that. Mm. Don't want that for yeah. your life. Want the struggle. The struggle is fantastic. The struggle to get – you know, to be a dancer. I, I, I love the struggle. <laughs> Yeah. It wasn't just easy, you know. It was, and when you get it and when you understand it, it's just such a fantastic thing, you know. And then as a dancer, when you, when you technically, you know, you work to a certain point, you get physically, you know, your body where it needs to be. And then the joy of the job is when, you, when you've lived, you've mm. loved, you've, you've been in stress, you've had sadness, you've had things, that's when you put that on the stage. And that's when the real artist is there. For sure. And that's, that, that, that for me was the greatest gift is that it was not just a, I never danced just for the physical side of it. I danced for the artistic side of it as well. There was nothing like some of those ballets. And you're at the end of the ballet and there's, you've been through a big story ballet, for instance, and you're just, you're exhausted on the stage and you've got that orchestra screaming up some unbelievable score some Elgar score or Tchaikovsky score or Dvorak score or something like that and you, it, you, you, it, it's yours I can't explain but it's like you just you take that into your veins yeah. and no one can take that away from me no one can take those incredible times away from me you know yeah Amazing. perfect I, I think that I can't think of a better way to end it so uh, <laughs> Paul Paul, thank you so much for coming on and uh, you know sharing some of your experiences and, and thank being you so very open. much really enjoyed it it was great talking with you